Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started because uh, we want to give as much time to question and answers as we can. Uh, first off, uh, what I'd to do is I'd like to be able to introduce uh, some of the group, the panel here. Uh, if you got a question, TJ, we got questions? Okay, hang on. Okay, first off, we want to do, just do a little brief introduction to the panel. And to our far right, we'll start with it with, Ms., with Dr. Uh, John Lopez, and he's the Director of Coastal uh, Sustainability Program for Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation. And uh, then to uh, the left of him will be Mr. Brent Haas, who is the Director, Executive Director of the Louisiana Coastal Protection and uh, Restoration Authority. And Mr. Mo, Dr. Moby Sangadli is the uh, president and executive director of the Institute of, for Marine Mammal Studies. And then we got, uh, let's see, who did I leave out? <coughs> Reed Hendon, I don't know, but I lost Reed Hendon in there. Some, oh, yes. Joey Wyndham. All right, I got Joey Wyndham. In other words, Joey Wyndham, uh, obviously you heard from him earlier. He's the chief for the Corps of Engineers Mississippi Valley Watershed Division. And uh, then we have uh, Reed Hendon, who is a di as the head of, I of uh, GCRL for the Gulf Coast in uh, Mississippi. I'm going to give each one of them just about a minute to go give a little bit of an overview or a little bit of an introduction, and then we'll go into questions and answers, and we'll start with you, John. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, John Lopez. I'm with the, uh, the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation. Uh, I direct our coastal program. Uh, just will we'll, uh, say that I'm struck uh, by, uh, reminded of, maybe I should say, by the similarities between Louisiana and Mississippi. Uh, I mean, our economies are very similar in terms of tourism, uh, shipping, navigation, and seafood. Uh, so uh, I think that the, uh, the thing I'd like to see come out is just more of what we're, what's happening today, more discussion about our, our kind of mutual problems, mutual solutions, hopefully, and uh, and how to move forward. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I'm Brent Haas. I'm the executive director of the Louisiana's Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority. And I, I would I would echo uh, John's comments and, and just say that I, I think that um, there's a lot of a lot of common ground, I think, between uh, coastal Louisiana and coastal Mississippi, and certainly want to want to explore that common ground here. And uh, we'll just reiterate as well the comments from uh, Mr. Klein and, and Mr. Barth earlier that uh, um, the Bonacare Spillway is not uh, the Mid Breton sediment diversion. And uh, looking forward to having those discussions with y'all here this afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Moby Solangi. Uh, I'm the president of the Institute for Marine Mammal Studies. Uh, for the past 35 to 40 years, uh, I've been studying uh, effects of uh, various uh, contaminants like crude oil to, you know, uh, viruses and stuff on marine mammals and sea turtles. We use them as the trap predator, as the canary in the mine. And over the years, we've developed a model in which we're able to predict from these animals through their strandings, through their populations, what may be transpiring in the environment that's affecting them. Basically, the philosophy is if uh, the top predators are doing well, everything in the ecosystem is doing great. Uh, I also echo the same uh, feelings that uh, Mississippi and Louisiana have a lot of common areas. The waters are common, our economies are common, and the animals do not recognize these artificial boundaries uh, of our states. They travel between the states, and we as individuals need to work together to see if we can find some solutions. So I think uh, General Spragan uh, has done a great job in putting this forum together for us to be able to uh, get our uh, thoughts together and come up with some uh, good solutions. We're looking forward to the panel discussion. Um, Joey Wyndham, Chief of the Watershed Division for uh, Mississippi Valley Division Corps of Engineers. Uh, just like to say, glad to be here. Um, uh, very important topics. Uh, just look forward to a uh, great open discuss discussion. Hi, uh, Reed Hendon. I'm with the University of Southern Mississippi um, School of Ocean Science and Engineering. I'm based at the Gulf Coast Research Laboratory in Ocean Springs. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, 
uh, GCRL has been in existence since the late 40s. We were the, we were the state's designated marine laboratory, became part of the University of Southern Mississippi. We work very closely with the Department of Marine Resources, Department of Envi Environmental Quality to um, understand what's going on in our coastal systems from the academic side, from a research side. And just like uh, the other panelists have said and the speakers today, you know, it's only through open dialogue and, and understanding, you know, the facts of what is proposed or um, what may happen uh, that, that we'll be able to come to some resolution that, that meets uh, the needs of citizens of both, both of the states. And it's um, obviously what we're talking about here is not a Louisiana or a Mississippi issue. It's, it's um, both of us. So uh, looking forward to the discussion. All right, thank you very much. Um, you know what, I told you a while ago, what was the key to air power? It was flexibility, right? Well, there's a gentleman in the audience that uh, I think deserves the opportunity to do something out of line, and that's be able, or not out of line, but out of the, what we've asked for. And that's be able to ask the question, and I'm gonna take the mic to him, this is the only one, but if when you get to be 90 years old, then you can do this, and I promise you I'll do it for you. But uh, I'm gonna let Mr. Vic Marver ask the very first question. My name is Victor Marver, and he's wrong. I'm not 90 years old, I'm 93. <laughs> but we used to be in the canned shrimp and oyster business in Biloxi. We had a fleet of right at 45 boats, average size, probably 50, 60 feet long. And when an oyster boat was getting ready to go out, there was never a question about whether or not he was going to catch a load. The question was, what day do you want me to unload? They brought in loads of oysters with water on deck. And little by little, that all disappeared. And one day in the 50s, a guy named Dave Etzel walked into my office and he said, Vic, I'm with Sea Grant and we have some money to help the seafood industry, but we don't know exactly what to do. So I told him about the absence of fresh water and how it was needed for the growth of oysters and other species. And we went to the Corps of Engineers to talk with them about it, Corps over in New Orleans. And they said, we already have three projects designed, but we can't get the money for them. Well, Trent Lott and Thad Cochran had just come into the picture, and I called Trent and told him about it. And by golly, it wasn't but a few weeks or a couple of months, they had the money. And the Corps started work. And the people in Lake Pontchartrain began to scream. They didn't want it. So we had a meeting and they killed it. But a freshwater diversion was, was built in a little town called Carnarvon, Louisiana. And another one was built over on the west side called Davis Pond. The one at Carnarvon diverts approximately the same amount of water that comes out of the Potomac. The one on the west side diverts approximately the same amount. At that time, Barataria Bay was called Grand Lake. There were so many oysters produced in there that people used to build homes on piling in the lake to live while they tended the oysters and kept people from stealing. All of this talk this morning, nothing was said about either one of those diversions, and I'm just wondering if you folks even know about them. And if so, uh, I have heard that the 
that they're not being operated properly. I don't know if that's correct, but I've heard that. That there was a fishing camp located near Carnarvon and he began to complain about the amount of water that was coming out. And the operator got mad and opened it up wide open and said, how do you like that? So I'm just wondering if you fellows know anything about that and why wasn't anything said about it? Uh, if that's okay, I'll go uh, first. Thank you, Mr. Marver. And uh, Brent, you might be able to answer that. I don't know. Are right, you a John? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Director Spragans. Uh, uh, Mr. Vavar, it's a great question. Uh, I was kind of cutting my teeth in those days in, in this realm of coastal restoration, but I do recall uh, the events. And uh, I think a lot has happened. And, and let me say just quickly, basically we support basically the objective that was then and now. Uh, the things I would point out is that there's been some major hydrologic changes. Uh, two, uh, uh, in particular, the closure of the MRGO has changed hydrology in Louisiana, but also we're now seeing these more frequent Bonacary spillway openings. So I think this needs to be re-looked at as, as uh, Dr. Mickle talked about, kind of understanding the hydrology, understanding you know where and how much water is needed to basically help the estuary. Um, and finally, I'll point out that there are some, some additional projects on the books that, that might satisfy what you're suggesting. Uh, in this, this Louisiana's Coastal Master Plan, there is the, uh, what's called the Central Wetlands Diversion, which some, at one point was called the Violet Diversion. And in our view, that was a project that could help address exactly the, the issue of maybe more fresh water in the, that part of Louisiana and Mississippi. Uh, but also, there is in the, the, the state's master plan a, um, a project to divert some of the water out of the Bonacary Spillway into the adjacent wetlands, which we have supported and uh, continue to support. So uh, there is some opportunity to, to, to kind of revisit this question, which I think is still an important question to ask. Thank you. Yeah, if I may, I, I would just add a few things to that. One, um, I, I would say that certainly the lessons learned from the Davis Pond and, and uh, Carnarvon diversions are being incorporated into the projects that Louisiana is planning uh, and designing uh, at the moment. Um, so they certainly are. It's important to note that the two, those, those projects are very different as well, though, from the sediment diversion projects. Those projects, uh, they actually were referenced earlier in, in Brad's uh, discussion, are designed to ameliorate saltwater intrusion, essentially. Uh, primarily for the benefit of, of oyster production in both the Baratari and and, um, uh, and Breton Sound basins, um, so they were referred to, and, and the lessons that uh, have been learned from those are being incorporated into um, into the ongoing work. You brought up another interesting point, though, I think, and that uh, really highlights the the dynamic nature and the way that our coasts have changed over time and, and continue to change and will likely change into the future. Um, and you mentioned um, uh, Trent Lott and Thad Cochran uh, essentially lobbying on behalf of the state of Mississippi for Louisiana to implement diversions uh, at that time um, to benefit Western Mississippi Sound essentially. And so obviously we've had a, a different different conditions, a much uh, much changed environment since that time. And so concerns have sort of been flipped on their ear and are, are perhaps opposite of what they were at that time. And one thing we know for sure is that as we look into the future, they're likely to change again. And perhaps those desires will be different. So. Um, General Spragans has been talking a lot about flexibility, um, and I think it's important for us to keep that in mind as we're planning the, the future of our, of our coast. Okay. All right. Thank you. And um, anything else? We're good with that? Mr. Marv, are you okay? Good deal. All right. Next question. And I'm going to direct this to uh, Joey Wyndham. And uh, 2020 hindsight. Uh, what lessons were learned in the 2019 from the Mississippi River? And if 2020 or 2021 is worse than 2019, what would the Corps do different to manage the, this, uh, the Mississippi River, Bonnie Carey Spillway? Joey? Um, well, I guess one lesson learned is, is that Flood seasons aren't necessarily in the spring. Uh, normally, you know, we pray for flood season uh, in the spring, 
that's when we get our high water. Uh, but uh, this year is, was all year long. Uh, so a lot of work that's done on levees, repairs, and stuff like that. Um, you know, how you plan for those, uh, maybe that needs to change because uh, a lot of work has been delayed because of the high water uh, at different times of the year. So I guess that's the first one that comes to mind. Um, as far as how do you change if 2020 is worse? Um, you know, where we sit right now, we sit um, about where we were last year uh, as far as the river. We're high. So what does that mean? Does that mean we're going to have a huge spring flood? Uh, no, it doesn't. In fact, if you take the top, if you take the 125 years of record I keep talking about that Noah has collected, the, um, the amount of winter floods that have translated into a spring flood is only about 40%. So that's a loose translation to me. So winter floods don't, or, or winter high water doesn't mean spring flooding. It's all about the spring rains. Um, so, so are we going to flood next year? Um, no. Right now we're high. We're susceptible. We're going to remain um, prudent and 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 make sure that we're prepared to fight floods. Should we, you know, right now we're above normal. We're not in major flood stage, uh, so we'll be prepared. Um, and as far as, as changing, I think is just making sure uh, preparations. Our, our reservoirs, our reservoirs throughout the valley, we just did a status check of them this week. Uh, we're 10% uh, capacity utilization. And so we are prepared to fight a flood. Uh, I mentioned Kentucky Barkley. Kentucky Barkley, we, we have, we raised the pool that's for, you know, our first trigger in the MRT system. We raised that pool in the summer, both for recreation, for power production. We have dropped that pool. We are now prepared for flood, uh, flood season. Uh, so I think preparation, preparation. Uh, will we have the spring rains, spring floods? They're all about the spring rains. Uh, and, and all we can do is get prepared for those. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, all right. Another question that we have is... Um, and once again, I'm not going to say who asked the questions because I, I want it to kind of be left as a question in general. But um, will there, with the new legislation that is uh, requested to speed up <coughs> monetary recovery for effect, business progress to the fast to be faster than the historic two to three years. So I'm not sure. But I think what they're asking is, uh, will there be new legislation that is uh, designed to speed up monetary recovery? Uh, I don't know who to ask that to, so if any one of you would like to take it. I think that's a question for you, Billy. Yes. <laughs> uh, they, I got three people, uh, two people in mind, three people really in mind, maybe four, and uh, it's called governor, a congressman, and uh, two senators. So uh, we'll ask them when we get a chance. But uh, I don't know that answer, and I don't know if y'all know it or not either. Um, I know that they're trying. I know they're trying hard. Okay. Let's see. All right. This is the question I would think would uh, go to um, Bryn and John, and it says, if diversions and spillways create land and marsh, why has no land or marsh been created in Lake Pontchartrain? Well, that's a, that's a good question, and it can be answered with a question that I'll ask perhaps as I, as I wrap up. Um, one of the, the first, though, and most, I guess, obvious uh, answers to that is that the sediment in the spillway is mined. Each time the spillway is open, uh, there is a tremendous amount of sediment, sediment that's deposited within the spillway. Uh, it doesn't often make it all the way to... Uh, um, uh, to Lake Pontchartrain, but um, but that's that sediment is, is dug up and is used and has been uh, placed under most of the homes in the greater New Orleans area uh, as fill for, for home building. Um, I would, uh, again, I guess answer the question uh, in, a, in a way with other questions, and that is, uh, you know, let's look at a map of Louisiana. Let's look at the places where the river is connected with its coast, and that's at the Wax Lake, at the Atchafalaya, and the Lower Mississippi River. Those places are building land unquestionably, and it's because of the connection with the river. 
Um, Brad um, did a very nice job describing the, um, the process of designing and locating these sediment diversions. Uh, but one of the parameters uh, he, he did not mention was that the outfall area is very important. And basically what you want is relatively shallow water areas. Uh, the deeper the water, the more accumulation of sediments you have to have to build that land. Lake Pontchartrain is a deep water body. And uh, the spillway, I know it has, uh, can have major freshwater effects, but it's really only been open 14 times in 70 years. And that sediment is going into a deep water body. Uh, but in spite of that, uh, in addition to uh, the sediment that, that is mined and commercially used in the Bonnicary Spillway, there's a cypress swamp there. And that cypress swamp is, is growing at twice the rate and is a very healthy swamp compared to the adjacent swamp just adjacent to it in the LaBranch wetlands where there's dying trees and very slow growing trees. So basically, uh, as been pointed out many times already, the Bonnie Care Spillway is not a sediment diversion. It's, it was designed for other reasons, operated for other reasons. It does tell us something about water and sediment, but it's not really the right model for what we're trying to do with these sediment diversions. Okay. All right, uh, question, and uh, I think this would go to, uh, I'll get probably USM, uh, and um, maybe you can help us with this one. If uh, the Mid-Britain diversion happens, what do you think will happen to the Mississippi Sound as far as the fisheries estuary? Given, given how far away that diversion is and coastal circulation patterns, I, I do think that that's a pretty Good long stretch. I do think that's a, a pretty good distance to have any major effects talking generally and, and not having a whole lot of information on it. But that is one of the things that um, actually John and I have been on several emails over the last uh, year or two, and we actually didn't meet till uh, about a month ago, month or so ago. And we're talking about collaborative efforts to look at circulation modeling in the lower Louisiana area as well as the Mississippi Sound. Uh, bring together the university expertise we have here in the state along with what they have um, in Louisiana and with uh, uh, John's foundation to model that. But generally speaking, that's a long way for that sediment to travel. Um, you would have to get much closer to our area uh, further up the, the river for diversions to, to have any, any impact, uh, again, generally speaking. Now, I will say, and getting to Mr. Malver's point, is Historically, if you take Bonnie Carey out of the equation, which is a big if, but you set that aside, what we are seeing with our fisheries reductions in the western Mississippi Sound is in fact due to a lack of fresh water. It's the, the low flow from the, the Pearl River, uh, the, wa the water is becoming uh, saltier, but it's also a function of the wetlands loss in Louisiana. Our quote unquote Biloxi Marsh area immediately south of, of Bay St. Louis, you've lost, we've lost marsh in that area. That marsh serves historically two purposes. The fresh, the fresh water that we do get, it helps hold that fresh water in the Mississippi Sound as opposed to flowing out more rapidly. It also prevents the saltwater intrusion. If you have less land keeping the saltwater from the Gulf out, obviously your waters in the Sound are, are going to um, uh, be saltier and especially with oysters, what we see is saltier, uh, saltier water brings in the predators, the oyster drills that, that wipes out the reef. So it's a combination of getting fresh water in at the correct, time, correct times and holding that fresh water in through natural structure. So there's certainly some commonality to the issues in Louisiana and issues in Mississippi, albeit some of it for uh, marsh restoration some of it for fisheries restoration, but there is a lot of overlap and I think that's where the continued discussions need to happen uh, when we look at how these projects may, it may impact us. And, and going back to what Paul Mickle said, Mississippi needs to look at it. Mississippi and Louisiana need to talk. And if it's bad for one, then that person needs to stand up and say, that's not gonna work for us. But it's having the, those objections, having the subsequent discussions and try to figure out if we can find a way to make these work for citizens of both states. Okay. 
All right, uh, the next one is kind of a two-part question. And it's, um, first is uh, addressed to the Louisiana group and, uh, and to all three of you. And the other one is to uh, basically to Moby. And um, the question is, did you support the Marine Mammal Protection Act waiver? If not, why? If yes, why? And do you still support it? And then the second part of it is for Moby is what does this do as far as your expertise in the mammals in the Gulf? Well, I, I would say it's it's not a matter of where whether I support it or not. Although I will I will tell you um, that I do. Um, the fact is that Congress enacted uh, the waiver. Um, but I want to be clear that it's a waiver from a permit under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. It's not a waiver. Uh, from an evaluation of impacts of our projects on marine mammals um, and or, or any coordination with NOAA or anybody else for that matter uh, in terms of, of what might be occurring in marine mammal populations. And I can tell you that, um, that Louisiana has spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of money as it relates to the Mid-Basin uh, Diversion Program already uh, to work very, very closely with NOAA to, um, to evaluate populations um, and set ourselves up to be able to uh, assess potential uh, impacts down the road uh, related to marine mammals. So I'll, uh, I'll let uh, Dr. Solange take it. Well, I think that's a very important question. Uh, the way it was passed, Congress said you should do this. Waivers are a normal process in fisheries, like the tuna fishery when the Marine Mammal Protection Act was enacted in 1972. They got a waiver that during fishing activities, certain number of animals would get caught, and after those animals were taken, so to speak, fishing would stop, or there would be a mitigation plan of how you would respond, whether it is the tuna fishery, whether it is construction, uh, dredging, uh, the Corps of Engineers, when you do a dredge of a canal, you have to protect the turtles that might be getting caught. And so there's a, a mitigation plan. And the way this waiver came about, I totally object to that. Uh, it, it ha to my knowledge, the agency did not uh, move this forward. They were told to grant the waiver. That's how it worked. So, uh, but that aside, you also have, for example, the Endangered Species Act. Uh, just about two weeks ago, you know, we released a couple of uh, ca uh, Camps Ridley and a loggerhead, put satellite tra uh, tags on it, and within three days, they had traveled about 80 miles and they were in Britain Sound. So I'd like to make a point, uh, Dr. Hendon has made a point, and others that, oh yeah, these are really very far apart. Really, this is one ecosystem. And if it wasn't one ecosystem, uh, Louisiana has tried to change the definition of essential fish habitat, which means that Britain Sound is no longer the spawning ground or something that may affect some other places. I think what happens in Mississippi Sound, Chandelier Sound, and in uh, Britain Sound is connected. Uh, Marine, Ma <laughs> Marine mammals on a daily basis travel to these different areas. On a daily basis, they can travel 30, 40, 50 miles without a problem. They share these areas. And another point that is always being made is fresh water. Well, let's be clear, the Mississippi River water has changed in the last 30, 40 years. It's no longer the same water that existed 100 years ago, both in terms of what it has in terms of uh, uh, the mud and silt and clay. Uh, it has declined because of damming upstream and and, and the changes in the natural flow of the river. Secondly, it has a lot of uh, uh, insecticides, pesticides, nutrients. That's why we have a dead zone. In the last 30 years, the mouth of the river, sometimes as big as 10,000 square miles, is considered a dead zone. And I think uh, we all need to sit down and talk about this. The Brit Britain Sound and Chandelier Sound and Mississippi Sound are interconnected as ecological uh, uh, units. The largest dolphin population in the United States is right here considered in the Mississippi Sound and Louisiana waters. Why is it that? It is because it's interconnected. Animals move, and they don't just stay in one place, and th this is their home. So I think uh, the same thing with the uh, 
50 years of uh, 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 Endangered Species Act would relocate uh, a Caps Ridley, for example, from here to Florida, considering Florida as turtle heaven, until Mississippi said, we're going to put satellite tags and see what happens to those turtles. We found that every turtle we put out in Florida came back to the same pier in Mississippi. How did they do it? Some went to Mexico, came back. So those were studies that proved that this is uh, uh, an area that is specific. So uh, I think Mississippi, Louisiana should not consider this as separate because we have these artificial lines. We should consider these animals as a unit. Uh, yes, of course, these are top predators, but they are also a good indicator that when they finally go as a top predator, like if we go in the ter terrestrial environment, that means the totality of the ecosystem is gone. And I think they are giving you an indication. We need to pay attention. We need to work with our neighbors to come up with a solution, not saying that what we do here is not going to affect you. It does. What affects the Gulf of Mexico affects the entire nation. This was established during the BP oil spill. So I think um, I look at it differently. Uh, I do object to the Marine Mammal Protection Act because it was done in not in the manner to mitigate it. We need to look at the ways not do it after the, the fact. We also should look at other endangered and threatened species that will be affected. Thank you. OK. Next one is for uh, Joey. Rex, and, may um, I add to that? I'm sorry? May I, may I add to that? Sure. So I, I would say that I, I, I do agree with Dr. Solange in one respect, and that is that this is, uh, we are talking about one ecosystem, right? And that ecosystem includes the Mississippi River. It includes our coastal wetlands. It includes our bays, our Bear Islands, and ultimately the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, really the heart of this waiver is Congress's recognition that the bedrock of the productivity that we uh, enjoy in Louisiana and coastal Mississippi really are those coastal wetlands, those coastal estuaries that are being lost at a tremendous rate, as we all have discussed already. Um, and it's also a recognition that the ecosystem restoration projects that we're talking about implementing in Louisiana is not the same as tuna fishing or the same as dredging a port or a harbor, uh, and that they are consistent, in fact, with the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK, uh, Joey, the question, I don't know if you know this or not, but this is a volume question. How, how much storage capacity exists in the entire Mississippi River Basin? Not a clue. <laughs> Not a clue. Not a clue. Um, the storage capacity in the Mississippi River Basin. Um, don't know. As far as maybe the question is leading to how much storage is in the Mississippi River. You get asked that question a lot. If you if you would draw down the river uh, before a flood came, would the, eventually the ultimate peak be lower? And maybe that's where that question is leading. And the answer would be no. The, uh, the Mississippi River, when you look at it, has no storage comparative to when you're talking about 1.8 million CFS or 2 million CFS coming down the river. So even if you drain the Mississippi River to the bottom, when that 2 million CFS is coming down from Cairo, that storage is evaporated immediately. Uh, so maybe that was what the question was going to. Okay. All right, let's see. See if I can figure out. I, I'm, I'm trying to put when somebody, two or three people, ask the same type question. I'm trying to make it to read all the same, using the, about both of them or more than one. Um, I guess this is uh, a, it's directed to Louisiana, and so any one of you. But uh, it says, do you believe your commercial fisheries community about the impacts from river water diverted out of the Mississippi River? If so, what are those impacts? If not, why? So uh, any of you from Mississippi, I mean from Louisiana would like to answer that? Well, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, do we believe commercial fishermen? I think the answer is yes and no. I mean, uh, we talk to a lot of fishermen, and uh, you know, one thing is that there's all kinds of different fishermen there. There's freshwater fishermen, uh, saltwater fishermen, different species. Uh, so 
it's not a yes or no answer. Uh, we certainly try and listen to people, uh, but we those opinions and information we get, we, we weigh that against what we think science tells us. So for my organization, the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation, we, we look at the, the, the science as the bedrock. We try to, uh, like I said, uh, engage with the public and fishermen uh, wherever we can uh, and try to have a, a two-way dialogue. But uh, the science does tell us uh, that diversions do work, uh, that they build land. We see it, as uh, Brent pointed out, and uh, we see it in the, the design structures, but also incidental uh, structures like Wax Lake, uh, which was not built to, to build land, but, but it is. And, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons why, uh, for those that are kind of uh, working intently on a restoration in Louisiana, uh, you know, the sediment diversion that we envision is uh, should be far exceed anything that we've seen in the past in terms of its performance. The, the, the amount of science and engineering that has gone into planning of these projects is enormous. And uh, so we have high expectations and, and we, we, we rely on the science and engineering. Yeah, I would, uh, I would just add, I guess, we'll, you know, another way maybe to ask that question is, will, will the sediment diversions that are being planned in coastal Louisiana um, change things? Will they change the status quo? Uh, and the answer to that is unequivocally uh, in the Barataria basins and the Breton Sound basins, absolutely yes. They're designed to change conditions in those basins. Um, what will happen if those projects are not built? the conditions in those basins will absolutely change. Um, and, it's, and it's without question that they will change for the worse. They'll be gone. There'll be no more wetlands to support the fisheries that we all enjoy um, and that help, help support our, uh, our culture and our economy. So um, again, things are gonna change whether we implement projects that we're talking about here today or not. Um, you know, the question really becomes, do you, do you try to manage that change, hopefully for the most good across our coasts, uh, or do you allow that change to inflict its will on us and our citizens? Uh, and in Louisiana, through our coastal master planning process and the implementation of the projects that we hope to implement, um, we hope to uh, we hope to be able to manage that change, hopefully for the best. Okay, anything else? All right, I'm trying to decipher all these together. It's amazing. Um, one of the questions, and uh, it's about the uh, Bonnie Carey area. Joey, I would assume it comes to you with this. It says, uh, you stated that the numerous all-time records were broken, yet you still did not utilize the 70,000-acre uh, Morganza floodway floodplain. If we did re-engineer re the trigger on the catastrophic year, like 2019, what, uh, what will, the, will it take to assess the trigger? What would, could, I guess what they're asking here is, um, is there something that we can do in Mississippi and Louisiana if we, to help the Corps of Engineers to be able, if it needed, to open up the Morganza to help alleviate some of the water going into the Bonnie Carey and being able to spread the wealth? Yeah. So, so right now, those projects are authorized uh, congressionally authorized to be operated a certain way. And then that's, we have water control manuals that we follow to operate those the way I mentioned earlier. We follow that diagram very strictly. Uh, to do something like the question, you know, suggest to maybe open more Ganza earlier or, or to change that, we would have to, to have that congressionally authorized change, the authorization change. Um, and so we would have to be asked by Congress to look, uh, to study that. Uh, so that's, that's what it would take. Okay, so uh, Congress is, is Congress authorized as y'all when to open it, is that correct? Yes, the projects are authorized to, for a specific um, reason, and they are authorized uh, to be open uh, to control the 1.5 at Morgans and the 1.25 at, at, Mar at Bonacare. Okay, and uh, tell me if you can't answer this, but it's just kind of a follow-on with that. Uh, if the core, to help the core to be able to manage that themselves, it would take uh, some type of legislation out of Washington to be able to change that, or is that something you're not wanting to talk about? I know that is correct. You are correct. Okay. That it would All take right. that. So that's something we would have to look at. We would obviously need our, our friends 
from Louisiana to be on board with us that happened and look at it and something we could possibly work together to be able to look at in the future. So General Spragans, if I may, I, along those lines, I would point out that um, that we have uh, made a request of, of General Toy uh, in Vicksburg uh, to take a more holistic look at management of the Lower Mississippi River to include many of the things I think that are of interest to, to folks here in Mississippi, obviously of, of interest to folks in Louisiana as well, uh, as it relates to potentially other outlets that would be less impactful both to the state of Mississippi and to the state of Louisiana, uh, and also making more room for the river, as was discussed in, in Joey's uh, discussion earlier, but uh, perhaps adding some of that that would help to slow water uh, that comes through uh, the states of Mississippi and, and Louisiana and potentially the Morganza or the Bonacare spillway as well. Um, so we have made um, um, a written request, the go our governor has made a written request to the general of the Mississippi Valley Division. Uh, we've also uh, made two requests, and this is something that we may want to discuss, General Shragans, with you a little more, um, but a word of 7001 request to evaluate um, this most recent uh, operation of Bonacary and sort of a after action review associated with that, but also to, to do the things that I just mentioned earlier in terms of uh, looking for smarter ways to manage this water, uh, have it entering our coasts more slowly, perhaps in a cleaner manner, uh, in a way that could reduce some of the nutrient uh, inputs to both of our coasts, uh, and to make more uh, more room for that water further up in the basin. Okay, and I know that our, our Secretary of State now, um, Delbert Hoseman, Hoseman, and our Lieutenant Governor-elect is a, a Hoseman, and he's asked uh, the Corps of Engineers also to do a study and to look at it. So uh, maybe. Um, and I'm sure the governor has also uh, spoke with them too. So maybe between the two, we can get them to look at it. And I know talking to General Kaiser earlier that uh, the Corps is doing a study now, and that's uh, to be able to take the four rivers and be able, Joey, you may be able to answer this, but the four rivers and do a study of what has changed in that and to the flow of those rivers and to what it, uh, how the effect is. Do you have any further on that, Joey? <laughs> yes, so that's the uh, Omar study. Uh, the Omar is the acronym for the rivers. Uh, it's the Washita, Mississippi, Atchafalaya, and Red River. So it's a study, it's a, I believe, a three-year study. Basically, it's to look at different, um, different aspects of the study, but it's to look at the, the sediment regime, how different uh, flow patterns within the Mississippi affects sediment uh, flow in the Mississippi River and how that changes over time and how, you know, all the effects that goes along with that. Yes, that is a current study that's ongoing that'll help answer questions. Uh, it doesn't answer all the questions, but it does answer questions, you know, if things were changed or, or um, you know, operations or stuff like that were changed, how, how the river would respond. Um, and yes, that is a, a current study going on right now. Okay. It's called the OMAR study. OMAR. All right, so we'll remember that one. And we can track that, and I know it's underway, is that correct? Do you have any idea what time of timeline you have on it? That is true. Uh, I think it is a three-year study. Uh, three or five. I'm, I'm drawing a blank here, but it's either a three- or a five-year study. Okay. Okay. The next one is, uh, I think, would, would be to um, CPRA and uh, Bren, and it's, uh, while admittedly attractive, uh, from an engineering perspective. The question is, is the river bend where you're looking at the natural place to obtain sediment for marsh restoration? And I think we're looking at the uh, mid bear Terror or either the Mid-Britain. Mid-Britain, I, yeah, I would, I would imagine. Um, so let me, let me start off by saying to my engineer colleagues in the audience that I'm not an engineer. Um, I, I do play one on TV occasionally. But um, I, the answer to that question is, um, our engineers, they have done extensive uh, in-river sampling to determine what is the best location to capture sediment in the river. And this, this location has been identified uh, as one of those locations. So uh, I'll keep it short and sweet so I don't get out of my lane too far, but uh, the, the short answer is yes, this is a good location to capture sediment and deliver it to uh, the Breton Sound Basin. Okay. Let me see if I can figure out where we're at now. <laughs> I think I've already asked that one. Um, all right, I think this would also be back to uh, your area in Louisiana, and it, it says, as you say, everything on the east of the river below uh, Bohemia is good for flooding, 
so no repairs will be made on the river levee there to control its banks. Uh, can you reassure the Mississippi folks that they will not feel effects of the Britain diversion? And what about the economic loss of the seafood in South Britain Sound? Why has not Mardi Gras Pass uh, been, been closed? All right, I'm just trying to decide. <laughs> That's a kind of a, low, a long question, so maybe you can help me with it. <laughs> um, there were a lot of questions, I guess, in there, and I'm, I'm sure I'll forget some of them. So if I do, General Sprague, is prompt me, please, and, and mm -hmm. I'll try to address uh, address what I can. I guess um, what I'll say, and I'll, I'll refer back to what uh, what Dr. Hendon, I guess, uh, mentioned earlier, that uh, you know it, it is unlikely um, from what we've seen. Uh, with high rivers and this this past high river, that that water from the lower Mississippi River that's getting into Breton Sound uh, will make its way um, to the Mississippi Sound. Um, that's fine and dandy for me to say. I know uh, you all probably don't want to and, and won't take my word for that. So I can tell you that as we're evaluating uh, the Mid Breton diversion, that is going to be part of the evaluation. Um, and if we find that to be the case, then obviously we've got to address that in a way that's satisfactory, as we've talked about uh, previously. So. Um, I might let uh, Dr. Lopez discuss Mardi Gras Pass a little more detail uh, than I, and if I need to circle back to anything that I didn't answer, I'm happy to do that. Well, uh, first of all, the context of Mardi Gras Pass is that it is, uh, just to be crystal clear on this, it's within what's called the Bohemia Spillway. The Bohemia Spillway was created in 1926. Uh, there was actually artificial river levees that were built prior to that and they were removed in 1926 to create a flood relief outlet. And that's the condition it's been in since 1926. Uh, we started going down there because uh, this was a, we thought, a completely unique opportunity to directly observe the process that we try to model and try to understand when we're in our office of how the river interacts and what does this reconnection of the ri reconnection of the river look like. Um, in 2011, uh, my staff and I walked the entire 12 miles in the flood and made up. And at the end of that flood, we began to see a place where there was some additional erosion. And in 2012, it cut uh, a new channel uh, that reconnected the river uh, at the location now called Mardi Gras Pass. Uh, the reason it uh, is not being closed is because it's not a permit authorized to close it. Uh, neither, I think, is there money to close it if there was a, a legal permit. Uh, but from our standpoint, uh, I'll admit that I think that's a good thing. Uh, it's not our decision, but we look at that as a good outcome. And the reason is that uh, we continue to observe what is going on down there, and that is important information in terms of this whole discussion about sediment diversions. Uh, one of the remarkable things we see is that it, it, it began building land within two years. Uh, it's now built at least 100 acres of wetlands over the last uh, uh, several years. So uh, one of this, uh, one of the uh, kind of uh, myths out there is that these diversions take a long time to build wetlands, and that, that Mardi Gras Pass directly proves that's not the case. So uh, in terms of fisheries, uh, in Mardi Gras Pass, which has one, been one of the arguments about maybe closing it, uh, in the area the immediate outfall area of Mardi Gras Pass, the oysters had already declined before Mardi Gras Pass developed in 2011. By 2008 or so, the oysters were pretty much gone in Breton Sound. And that's a matter of record. Uh, we can show you the data. So Mardi Gras Pass did not ruin the oyster fisheries there. Uh, it is preventing maybe recovery of oysters now because there is additional fresh water. But one of the interesting things this past year, uh, we had a, uh, overnight a, a bonanza, frankly, of crawfish uh, down at Mardi Gras Pass. And there were crawfishermen that were literally coming from all over the state of Louisiana to commercially harvest crawfish. So this gets back to Bren's uh, point earlier about change. In Louisiana, change is inevitable, and uh, it's always been change in Louisiana. And, and the really, I would say, the really uh, smart and uh, creative uh, fishermen uh, transition with that where they can. Not saying it's not easy. Uh, it can be. It is hard and difficult, and we want to try and assist those. But uh, we look at Mardi Gras Pass as a great uh, science experiment, uh, and but also a great restoration project. It is building land, 
but it's also an example of, of maybe uh, changes in fisheries and maybe response by, by fishing. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Um, all right. This is, uh, I'm going to try to reword this as best I can to get that, get what I think the gentleman is asking. But it's about the Corps of Engineers and uh, allowing uh, this diversion or anything else to happen to be able to uh, have you looked at it as to whether or not it would destroy and kill the heritage of Louisiana and uh, Mississippi and uh, the fishery in the water. And uh, the question is, Joey, I'm not sure that's something in your line, but um, also uh, Louisiana, Brent, any of y'all, you may answer that question. But the other part of it is, could we dredge and make marshland rather than use Mississippi River to make sediment for it? I didn't hear the front part of the question. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't catch the first part of the question. All right, the first part of the question just... was, uh, uh, is the Corps going to allow, and that's why I said I'm not sure that that's your expertise, Joey, yeah. uh, as to whether or not the Corps is going to allow them to do something because uh, the EIS hadn't been done either yet, so that might be another answer. But so, right, no, so, so, so um, go ahead. No, the, the permitting process, as he mentioned on the timeline earlier, is is not there yet. So there'll be a permitting process where the yeah, Corps so will look at. The short answer is we don't know. Uh, we don't know if these projects will be authorized. Um, and I'm speaking specifically the two mid-diversion projects, mid um or, or mid-Breton. Uh, we're a little further along on the west side of the river, which I know is not uh, – of, tr of tremendous concern to folks here uh, in Mississippi, but we, we're not through the EIS process or the permitting process on that project, and as has been discussed here earlier today, uh, we're on the very, very early stages, or in the very, very early stages of the uh, EIS and permitting process on, on Mid-Breton. So the short answer is we don't know yet, and we won't know until we have uh, a record decision, as Brad was discussing um, earlier in his, in his talk. Um, I think the second question was related to can we dredge to create wetlands, is, was that? Yes, uh, can you yeah. dredge? So the, the answer to that is absolutely. Um, it's a huge part, as I understand it at least, and correct me if I'm wrong, of, of Mississippi's coastal restoration uh, program, uh, rebuilding barrier islands and wetlands and so forth. And it's really, and it's uh, the biggest part by far um, of Louisiana's coastal restoration program. Um, our program is, you know, 30, 40 years old, depending on how you look at it, and, and quite frankly, the vast majority, about 99% of what we've done in coastal Louisiana has been dredging uh, to create coastal marshes, create barrier islands, and create uh, uh, ridges along our coast. Um, if you look at our plans moving forward, uh, if, in terms of the master plan in particular, um, you saw the, the slide that Brad put up earlier with the bar graph, $25 billion anticipated to be spent on restoration and $25 billion anticipated to be spent on risk reduction projects. If you look at that 25 that's associated with restoration, almost 80% of that is associated with dredging and constructing wetlands. Um, the issue that we have there, uh, first of all, we know it works. We do it. That's what we do. It's most of what we do, quite frankly. Uh, it, it, it's quick. Uh, you can get benefits very quick. But the issue that we have is it doesn't address the fundamental problems that really cause that land loss in the first place. And that's why we also have, as a part of our, uh, our restoration program, uh, reintroducing the river to our coastal wetlands to help s sustain what we have, help sustain what we've built, and to help grow more new land along our coast. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Uh, this other one's been asked, but I'm going to kind of, I guess they may have asked a little bit more into it, so I'll add this. Uh, and it goes back to what I asked uh, Dr. Hendon a few minutes ago about the fact of uh, will there be an adverse effect uh, on the uh, shrimp crabs and why and how would the uh, Mid-Britain diversion not, uh, I'm not sure if we're it's saying that, I guess why it would not en enhance that. If there was a problem with the shrimp and crabs and the fish and the speckled trout and we're having, pro and we lost, having lost of it, how do, can we say that the Mid-Breton Sound would not uh, ad adversely affect that to where it would be more loss? At this point, I don't know that we can say if it would be good or bad, and I think that's where the discussions with, with, with John and um, between DMR and LDWF come into play is looking at the circulation modeling, uh, both from where does the settlement fall out, which is certainly going to be closer to um, the exit point from the river than uh, the freshwater, it, it will travel further. But 
you know, you've got to look at what predictions are, what is normal circulation in that area, and what is this new input of fresh water into that area? How does that change? And that that varies month to month, season to season, depending on um, circulation patterns in the Gulf of Mexico, wind patterns, whether or not we have a spillway. There are a lot of variables that go into how water and sediment travels when it gets out of the river and into our highly variable coastal water. So I don't think we could say good, bad, or indifferent at this point. It's something that we'll have to look at, and I know that uh, DMR will will be doing that, and uh, I'm sure be pulling in the university partners to, to assist with that where necessary to protect the interests of uh, the folks here in Mississippi. But um, hey, uh, All right, listen, we're not going to have any outburst. Anyway, at this point, you know, we could make suppositions all we want, but until we look at the modeling, we look at the data, um, this is all, you know, fairly fresh. And uh, from our perspective, from USM, you know, we just had, had discussions a, a few weeks ago on it, but we will continue to have those discussions, continue to work with, with John and university partners to look at the data we have, look at the models we have, integrate those. A lot of the models are disjointed. They're for the Gulf or for one area, and they don't, you know, consider freshwater input. That's something that, you know, DMR is looking at. That's something that we're looking at through our um, Mississippi's uh, Restore Act Center of Excellence, which has been focused on oysters and water quality, plugging the models we have in for the Western Mississippi Sound to take into account the Pearl River input and to tie into Chandelier Sound and the Northern Gulf of Mexico. There's a lot of compartments that need to be tied together, and that's what we're working on. And those are going to give us at least some predictions with some degree of certainty around those about what will happen with these diversions. But I, I don't know anybody right now that could say for sure good, bad, or indifferent. Okay. Yes, John. Uh, thanks, uh, Joe. Uh, just to add, I agree with uh, Reed's comment uh, that basically the hydrology of the sound underpins the ecology and the species that we care about, like uh, shrimp, crabs, oysters, and so forth. Uh, but one thing I'd like to say is that uh, you know, that sounds like it's way out in the future, and in some ways it is, but I think there are things we can do now to, to help more immediately. Uh, and mainly, I, I think we just need better monitoring, and uh, if we can monitor the conditions in the sound on both sides of the state line, I think it's better. Uh, there is a certain capacity to try to reduce some of the impacts uh, by knowing the conditions. Uh, I'm not sure in, in Mississippi if, if this is allowed, but in Louisiana, uh, if they know fresh water is coming, they will sometimes let the oyster fishermen go in and harvest before the oysters are impacted. So things like that, that uh, the real-time monitoring is something that we can do immediately to try and at least a little bit improve, uh, you know, mitigating some of the negative impacts. Okay. And, uh, you know, one of the other things, and Brent, maybe you can answer this, uh, is there anything in the study that y'all have done so far or anything about the uh, Mid-Britain diversion that uh, says that it will not cause brackish saltwater marshes area, but it will not cause a destruction to the to the saltwater area in the, uh, I guess it would be the Mississippi Sound area. Well, I, I would say not, not yet. Um, I mean, uh, we, um, uh, again, I'll refer back, I guess, to the comment made earlier that that's, that's uh, seems unlikely, but there obviously is some attention that needs to be paid to that. Um, it is a concern, obviously, to the folks here. It's a concern to the people in Mississippi, in uh, Louisiana, excuse me, as well. But that's all part of the process that Brad laid out earlier in his, in his talk that deals with uh, both permitting uh, and the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, uh, that gets us to an EIS. Um, that again is just kicking off one of the first steps in that process is scoping uh scoping is a, an effort to hear from you all uh citizens of louisiana and anybody for that matter certainly citizens from mississippi uh, about what things need to be considered as that process is moved forward and uh and things are evaluated and certainly i would expect um uh, impacts of mississippi sound to be one of those things that uh, will be raised and certainly will be evaluated as part of that uh, that process okay Oh, one other question back to you again. <laughs> so we're not going to leave you alone on this one. Uh, the question is that um, some other people have brought this to Mississippi, uh, the South Mississippi's attention, 
why has Louisiana not brought this to our attention before now? Well, I would, I would, I would refer back, I guess, to my previous answer, to be honest with you. Uh, first of all, we're very, very early in the process here. Um, uh, what we've really been concentrating on is the Midbury Terry diversion that's on the western side of the river and certainly won't have any impact um, um, east of the river and, and obviously not in, in Mississippi Sound. So uh, as, as was uh, mentioned earlier by, by Mr. Klein, um, we've not had this meeting, in fact, with, with our own citizens yet because of where we are in that process. Um, we, um, we have uh, involved Mississippi in the more broader discussion, however, um, as part of the framework development team and developing our master plan, which has included the Mid-Breton sediment diversion, uh, the mid Terry sediment diversions, and others for that matter, uh, dating back really to the 2007, um, well, let me, let me backtrack that a little bit, about the 2010 or so time frame. Um, so, uh, so we have had more broad discussions. Uh, we're just now getting at the point to the getting to the point in the process to start having more specific discussions about what we're all talking about here today. Um, and so that's, that's the answer. It's just it's a matter of where we are in the process. Uh, we're certainly open to those discussions. That's why we're here today. Uh, as Mr. Klein mentioned earlier, we certainly look forward to continued dialogue uh, and, and a, a partnership in addressing these concerns and these, uh, these issues as we move forward. Okay, and uh, got Two questions, but one is uh, toward the end, and we want to go ahead and ask this other one. Uh, you talked about you've got to possibly have uh, three public uh, scoping meetings, or, you know, in the near future. Is it possible, or is it planned to have one in South Mississippi? Uh, yes, is the answer. It is possible. Um, that is a, a decision that the Corps of Engineers uh, will make ultimately. That's it's their process. It's a federal process where uh, an applicant. Um, for a permit and the EIS is part of that permit um, application process. Um, but uh, we certainly heard the concerns here loud and clear and, and uh, to the extent that we can, um, you know, we, uh, we would recommend that, that that occur. Okay. And the other question is, the other question is, uh, is there a, a progression towards a joint uh, Louisiana-Mississippi legislative submittal of a change in the law and or flood control set points that DMR, or Gulf Coast Business Council, or anyone else is involved in. And uh, I can tell you, I think you've heard here today that there's discussion, I think Brent has talked about a discussion that they've already had with uh, their, con their congressional staff. We're having uh, discussions with ours to be able to look at this. We have discussed this with the Corps of Engineers and uh, talked about what's possibilities of anything to be done in the past, uh, to correct what's done in the past. I think it, um, as to whether or not, yeah, obviously, uh, we won't know that answer until we have time for them to be able to look at things. But I can tell you, we're definitely looking at it every way we possibly can in Mississippi. And I know that our congressional and our uh, state government is looking at it every way possible. Louisiana. Uh, I think that I answered part of that. Do you have any further? Yeah, General Sprague, because I can add to that and, and what Brett said earlier. Um, yes, yeah, so language that would allow us to look at the system is what we need. And, then, you know, and that, that language gives us kind of like the Omar study. The Omar study is not the answer. We'll a answer some things, but that study would let us look at things, how, how what, you know, changing stuff, how the effects uh, changes upriver, downriver, all that, all that entails, and then that a, that allows us to present that data, and then, then it would take an authorization based on that to change how we operate now. So yes, that is the first step. Brian, you have anything? No, I, I think you captured it well. Okay, I did miss one. I'm sorry, and uh, it's asked on your EIS that you mentioned, and they said they may have overlooked it, but. Uh, you talked about the effects on commercial. Are you looking at the effects on recreational fisheries? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The answer is yes. I think that answered it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Now, what we want to do is I want to give each one of you about a minute. If you have any closing remarks that you'd like to say, that's our last of our questions. And uh, then we'll go ahead and uh, close this session. So we'll start with you, John. Okay, um, my opening comment, I mentioned the commonality between Louisiana and Mississippi, and I uh, just want to say that I believe the, 
our organization reflects that. Uh, we, we, we work with all entities. We support uh, commercial industry. We, we support economies. We're, we're, we're trying to help build resilient uh, communities. So we're not one-dimensional uh, in terms of the environment. Uh, we, we try to look at things more holistically. And when you look at the scale of these kinds of things, like we've been talking about all afternoon, uh, they do almost impact all of those things. You know, you can't, you know, something like the Western Mississippi Sound, it ripples across uh, uh, various stakeholder interests and uh, industries and so forth. So it is complex, but it, but we, we, we try as, as the state, and I think everyone at this, this table tries to look across the board at those things. So uh, uh, the one thing I'll just close on is, is, you know, this is a great meeting. I think this is a start of a dialogue, as someone said earlier. Uh, we, we are very interested in working with Mississippi and try to come up with some common solutions and, and, and get them done. You know, we want to see action. We want to see things uh, on the ground moving, whether it takes legislation, whether it takes money, uh, whatever. So uh, I'll, I'll close there. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, I, I would. I would really just want to highlight again. I think um, the fact that the the Monacary Spillway and the Mid Breton Sediment Diversion are two different animals, different locations, uh, different designs, different constructions. Uh, different operations, different volumes, different durations, uh, and all of that, you know, we believe certainly adds up to, to different potential impacts, certainly to, to coastal Mississippi. Um, again, that said, um, the concerns uh, that have been raised here and have been raised elsewhere, frankly, uh, in Louisiana as well, um, related to the mid breton sediment diversion are not falling on deaf ears, and I just want to assure you that we uh, anticipate that this is the beginning of a robust dialogue to address those concerns, uh, and as Brad mentioned, um, uh, develop the best project that we can uh, for the Gulf Coast. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brent. Uh, thank you, General Spragans, for hosting this uh, group. I think the recognition that comes in that uh, Mississippi and Louisiana are together in this. Uh, we have uh, a common grounds for both e economic and ecological aspects. That rec recognition is extremely important that we are interdependent and uh, that we will continue to have a dialogue. One of the biggest concerns that ever came out of all our discussions for the last year was Mississippi wants a voice and participation in the process. And I think uh, this, this was a very good attempt uh, by DMR and the Business Council and the folks from Louisiana to say, let's get together, including the Corps of Engineers, that uh, this is something we can all work together and it is necessary to work together. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'd just like to comment on the operation of the Mississippi River. I mean, we have a, a very strong relationship with NOAA, with, with the states. We're constantly collecting data, um, rain data, you know, river, date, uh, river gauge data, trying to look for efficiencies. How can we better our operations? That's something we do, not only Mississippi River projects, but all, all of our dams. We have 700 and something dams nationwide. And there's no doubt efficiencies that we continuously do and, and implement into our projects. Um, and we will continue to do that with the Mississippi River. Uh, with the MRT projects, a very successful project. Uh, it is doing what it's authorized to do, but there's no doubt there's, you know, as any project, there's efficiencies or advantages that we can take. And, uh, and I think we've outlined you know, some things that, that would need to happen for us to do that. But uh, just, you know, just wanted to comment on it, that you know, there are always efficiencies uh, in the Corps of Engineers, along with other federal partners, are always looking at taking opportunities uh, to better that. I would just say there are obviously many aspects of this project there's the social political the the fishery side but you know one component of that and what i think as a scientist is a big component is the science you know the modeling trying to understand what our current system is what the impacts of that system would be based on different scenarios um that's something that uh general spragans and dmr and the state have never hesitated to ask of usm or the other university partners and and we look forward to continuing to help the state and work with Louisiana and uh, uh, John and his group to see what the questions are, to understand what the data are. Uh, again, we're very early in this process and 
science is predicated on on facts or you know good data in which you can glean from those so i would just say be patient with that um you know allow us to work together to try to understand what this is obviously emotions are going to be high at those other levels but at the science levels you know it takes time it takes sitting down and understanding what what we know and what we don't know and and how we can get to some uh, conclusion as to what to expect all right thank you well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, first off, I'd like to thank USM because uh, allowing us to use this uh, auditorium and being able to do this today, so I appreciate them. Let's give them a round of applause for USM. <laughs> also, our security and staff, we thank you for what you've done by putting this together. Uh, Ashley Edwards and the, and the Gulf Coast Business Council, thank you for hosting it. I don't know where Ashley's still in here. He's somewhere around, but thank you so much for hosting this. Uh, Chip Klein, thank you for... Uh, uh, bringing Louisiana over to Mississippi today and from the Louisiana Governor's Office of being able to come here and uh, and help uh, us understand a little bit more. We'd like to thank our speakers, uh, Paul Mickle for his uh, speech, uh, Joey Wyndham for his, and Brad Barth for his speech. And also uh, to this great panel that we have here on our right, uh, John Lopez, Ben Haas, Bobby Sangati and Joey Wyndham and Reed Hendon. Let's give them a round of applause and thank you so much for what you did. Uh, we have the building until about six, so there's still refreshments out there. If you'd like to have some, please stick around if you like and, uh, and uh, maybe network a little bit. Chip, I can just tell you as far as from Mississippi, we look forward to continuing this dialogue. We look forward to continuing to work with Louisiana and to work through this process together. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank you. I hope each and every one of you learned something today. And if you have questions, uh, we have your emails, but you can get mine. If you don't, it's out there. Uh, I think there's some cards and all. You can get my email and call and uh, send me an email. We will direct it to anybody that needs to be directed to in this staff or in this panels. And uh, we will look at it and try to get you an answer back as soon as possible. Thank you so much for all your time. Thank you for listening to us. And may God bless each and every one of you.